the title of my talk today is Breaking the Fifth Wall. We'll talk about what I mean by that, because there is no what that means. It's an idea I came up with. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But ultimately, it is a topic about computer-mediated communication, but really the way that computer-mediated communication makes accessible to us sort of a new way to think about both mass-mediated communication, interpersonal communication, and brings these ideas together. I think as I uh, shared initially in the short abstract that I, I gave, I think there are a number of ways that computer-mediated communication might be used to be able to bring together these often fairly diffuse or thought of as diffuse areas of study. There's not a whole lot of mass communication, interpersonal communication mergers. There's a lot of people who, you know, go get a PhD and they'll come out and they'll be, you know, org common interpersonal or small group and interpersonal. Um, you might be computer mediated communication and interpersonal. There's several of us, I think, in this room who would probably describe ourselves that way. Or you might be computer mediated communication and mass media or organizational and mass media. But two that rarely go together are interpersonal communication and mass media. And I think that computer mediated communication brings together and gives us a way to start to think about these often diffuse ideas these often diffuse theories by looking at the computer-mediated communication that happens at that level. So just to kind of briefly uh, cover what I'd hope to cover today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the functional perspective and give you a, a little bit of a primer on that. I'm going to talk about a brief history of blended communication study. When I say blended communication, really I'm talking about the study of communication that kind of blends interpersonal and mass mediated communication through the the study of interpersonal communication. You'll get a better idea of what I mean about that. We'll talk about one um, upcoming modern theory of blended communication that I'm very hopeful you'll be able to read about this fall and coming to a journal near you. And then finally, it wouldn't be a presentation from somebody from Michigan State if we didn't have some quantitative empirical research that I presented to. So the first place I'd like to start is to, by talking about the functional perspective. I have to talk about the functional perspective, I think, by contract. Now, I recently was able to, was fortunate enough to be able to release with one of my colleagues uh, to publish this book uh, called Up to Date Communication and Technology and Romantic Relationships. If you're at all interested in communication technology in romantic relationships, give that book a read. Um, it's actually available and it's the truth be told, we were very careful to make sure that our publisher was going to release it in soft cover format, which means you can buy it for less than $40 US and not like these hundred dollar hardcover books that are just insane. Um, so in that book, in the very introduction, we talk a little bit about what the functional perspective is and why we think it matters. And the functional perspective, the way I'm going to use it and talk about it just briefly here today, it's a super simple idea. The functional perspective basically states that people utilize the tools at their disposal. In other words, they utilize the communicative cue systems, they utilize the nonverbal tools that they have, they utilize the media that are available to them to be able to achieve their goals, right? Each, there are a number of different functions that communication can serve. I think that's probably not a surprise to you if you really think about it, right? We're trying to do one of two things, one of a few things when we send a message or we deliver a message to another person. We might be trying to relate to them. We might be trying to become better friends or make them like us, or we might be trying to influence those other people. Sometimes we use messages to be able to organize groups of people to do a certain task, right? But at the end of the day, our communication has a function. We're trying to achieve something. And I very much believe that. And I think that this does fundamentally, though, it invites us to think differently about the way we think about communication. One thing is that it allows us a greater clarity and cohesion of associated research questions. Sometimes it turns out that even if you're an organizational communication scholar, even if you're a small group or family communication scholar, 
you care about influencing people, right? You care about the ways that people are influenced in organizations or influenced in families or influenced in romantic relationships. Sometimes in organizations, we care about the ways that we send messages to get other people to like us, right? Well, that's traditionally thought of as an interpersonal question. But is it any different getting a person to like you in an organization as opposed to in a friendship? Well, I don't really think that it is. In many cases, these the functions that exist, the functions that communication serves works to bring together research questions from diverse areas. And that's really cool. And it's really cool because it can integrate insights from multiple theoretical frameworks, things you haven't thought of before. It turns out if you're an interpersonal communication scholar, I'm just guessing here, but you probably don't read a whole lot of organizational communication work and vice versa. And probably if you're an interpersonal communication scholar, you don't spend most of your time reading, you know, entertainment, media and entertainment theory. That's not uniformly true. There are some people who do read that broadly, but by and large, a lot of times these are sort of diverse, right? The point that we make with the functional perspective, and by the way, the functional perspective is not an idea I came up with. Um, it's been around long before me and has been championed by others. If you're interested in that kind of history, you can go read the, um, the introduction of the book. But the point is that this allows us to integrate ideas from a bunch of different areas from all across the discipline of communication and then put these ideas together under a singular theoretical umbrella. And then finally, it helps really to unite scholars and bring together diverse groups of scholars from all across the world, all across the world, all across the discipline of communication and all across really of academia. Uh, mostly, I mean, mostly social science, um, but even a farther flung areas of scientific endeavor. So I think it's a really important thing that allows for us. And, and in fact, it demands that we bring together ideas that are diverse and ideas that really are connected by the function that a message serves more than the context in which that message arises. I'm kind of a stickler with that. On, I have become more with my graduate students that it's not so much the context that we do the research in. It really is all about the question and the way it can apply to some function, some theoretical function of communicative message sending back and forth. Okay. So let's talk a little bit of history. These two fellows are gone now. They no longer are with us, but came up with a theory called two-step flow. This was one of the first attempts uh, to really kind of put together the idea of interpersonal influence and um, of mass mediated influence. Up till this point, generally speaking, it was sort of the hypodermic needle model of mediated influence, which is the mass media inject ideas into the population, into the public, and the public just takes those ideas. That was as much about influence as we knew. Um, in the United States, these, these gentlemen were living in the United States at the time. They were doing this work um, around the time of the Second World War, um, so the, uh, the war with Germany and Japan. At that time, it became very important for the, the, well, the United States government decided they cared a whole lot about being able to influence the public. And the reason that they needed to influence the, the public was that they needed money and they needed it bad. The United States was at that time just emerging from what we refer to as the Great Depression, which took place approximately between 1928 and uh, the early part of the 1940s. And the reason that that needed to be over was that we were going to have some pretty big expenses if we were going to go to war. And um, the government thought to themselves, well, one great way to raise money 
is through the use of war bonds. And so they put together a few of these, these thinkers and the guy on the right there, uh, his name is Paul Lazarsfeld, was one of the foundational crew who came together and kind of solved this problem the, for the United States government. How do we convince the American public to do something, right? That was their question, purely and simply. And the field of persuasion was born. Um, and there were a number of ways, there's a number of, uh, of foundational studies that kind of spurred off from that. Uh, but two-step flow was one of those approaches. And it really sought to understand how do we use the media? How do the media influence the public? And two-step flow essentially argued that it's not as simple as a hypodermic needle in which you can just uh, inject an idea into the public. In fact, it's a little more complex than that. Instead of just injecting an idea into the public, um, what, we, what we have to do is we have to communicate with people we'll call opinion leaders, these thought leaders, these people who other people around them respect, and the media tend to change their minds. And then they interpersonally go and communicate with the little groups of people that they're in. Right? And that's the idea of the two-step flow model. It's not a, a single from the mass media to the public kind of message or influence structure. The two-step flow model says, no, it goes through and relies upon interpersonal communication. This is approximately 1955. Two-step flow is becoming popular. Um, now, if you're reading this critically, you probably have some critiques of the two-step flow model. You would not be alone. There are, there are a number that, first of all, there is a, a lack of widespread empirical support. That's not to say there's no empirical support that this model is exactly how it happens, but it's not great empirical support. There are a lot of bound, oops, sorry, a lot of boundary conditions um, there are a lot of times when things don't work exactly this way. There's the potential for this model to be overly simplistic. And I think if you're thinking it all critically about this, you can imagine how this is probably a little overly simplistic. Um, and it ultimately fails to account for the fact that the public directly receives sometimes and is sometimes influenced by mass mediated messages, right? In some ways, it takes a very dim view of the wisdom of the, any public that receives a mass-mediated message and presumes that they're not competent really to receive that message. Now, as I say that and I look at the American public, I think, yeah, I can kind of see that. Um, it, and I think that that's kind of the point. There are a couple real grains of truth that are going on here. It might not be a perfect model. But my goodness, it's not a bad one either. So this was really sort of one of the first attempts to really talk about and really think about the way interpersonal communication and mass-mediated communication, they kind of work together, right? There is an influence on one hand. The media definitely influenced the public. But boy, they sure don't do it without interpersonal communication to kind of buoy their messages. And specifically, I'll point to Elihu Katz, who only fairly recently passed away in uh, 2021, uh, so last year, as a really sort of the pioneer in this line of thought. I really have a lot of respect for that work. Now, this is not where the history uh, lesson sort of ends. So the two-step flow model was, has not been the only attempt of mediated and interpersonal researchers to kind of merge and come up with a blended theory of everything, sort of, specifically as it has to do with influence. Uh, another great book uh, that I have enjoyed reading, and I would commit to you if you're interested in, in this particular topic, is uh, Gumpert and Cathcart's uh, Intermedia, Interpersonal Communication in a Media World. Uh, which is an edited volume and um, focuses specifically on a number of essays that sort of address this problem. And this book was 
put out initially in 1979, re-released in about 1990. It turns out about every 10 years, people really started to get excited about this idea. Um, and so it probably shouldn't surprise you that in about 2020, that was when I started to get excited about it. But there's a few other stopping points. The first one requires a little bit of personal story. Turns out I've been interested in this topic for some time. Um, and in fact, when I was a doctoral student at Michigan State University, in my second year in the doctoral program, we started writing a few essays that dealt with this topic. And I did that along with my doctoral advisor, Dr. Jill Walther, and graduate student colleagues, Stephanie Tong, Dave DeAndrea, and Caleb Carr. And this was sort of the genesis for me of the idea. And I'm not saying that I'm the one who came up with all this. Uh, I was merely a part of a team. But the genesis of my thinking that, man, isn't it kind of interesting that in the era of the modern internet, and I know you're thinking 2011, he's really old, and you're right. Um, but already back in 2011, I will tell you, we had what I would I sort of think of as a modern internet. We had Hulu, we had YouTube, it was all there. And so those kinds of media opportunities allowed for the creation of content um, and, and even for mass media sources to deliver content to a public. And, but that wasn't the only communication that was happening about that content. In fact, there were a bunch of crazies who would sit there, consume that content, and then write comments about it. So there's like this waterfall of communication about this media. And now at the same time we're consuming mass media, at the same time we're, we're taking this message that's coming from one source and going to many people, I'm also having this sometimes one-to-one -one conversation, sometimes uh, many to many conversation that's happening. And, um, and this was just a super intriguing idea to myself and to my colleagues at the time. And this isn't the only uh, chapter we published on this idea of looking at, you know, who are these peers that are, are communicating with one another and what are we learning from them and how is this affecting the way we understand media? And we weren't the only ones doing this, you know? Um, I would also point to Patty Valkenberg and Yoshim Peters' uh, work in the, the differential susceptibility to media effects model. Ultimately, that model published in JOC, it's a, really a very similar idea, and they're, they're kind of arguing. Now, they're more media people. They're more mass media people. That's kind of their focus. I don't fault them for that. That's what they study. And it's all about how do these individual differences, and basically interpersonal communication falls under individual differences, at least in that particular piece. Later, though, uh, Patty Falkenberg and Dr. Walther worked together to publish a special issue of, I think it was HCR, um, that looked at some of these issues as well. So this is work that's been going on, this one right now, and it's because um, I was really only along for the ride. And so I want to introduce you to someone. This scholar's name is Sarah Grady. Sarah Grady is one of our current doctoral students. And for her uh, prelim paper, which is now in press at Journal of Communication, I expect it to come out uh, later in 2022, she published a model called the Social Influences on Media Use Model. Now, okay, Sarah is in fact a media scholar. That's what she really cares about. And so there's a lot of ultimately the dependent variables here are all media use kinds of variables. But Sarah is smart, very smart. And she has in her work really sort of eschewed some of the normal boundaries that communication scholars tend to section themselves into. She's in the process of publishing, but it's in press. She published this article that essentially argues that media choices, experiences, and outcomes are influenced by our social environment, including the conversations that we have around the dinner table, the social affordances of the media, and a lot of, if you're a CMC scholar, a lot of the CMC variables are going to pop up 
in these media social affordances, and then the social needs that we have. In other words, there are, when we consume mediated messages, those sort of live in this ocean of other social stuff we've got going on. And we can't separate those things easily. And then importantly, this is a recursive model, right? So not only do social environments, social affordances and social needs affect media outcomes and media experiences and media choice, but media choices affect our social environment and media's social affordances, right? So all of these things work together. Now, I'll tell you, this is not the kind of model that you can easily do a quick um, data collection, a survey data collection on measure each of these things and run a path analysis and have a happy result, right? Um, it's This is a heuristic model. This is more of a theoretical model. Its heuristic value is in its ability to help us to generate new research questions and new research ideas. And so this, her work really did that for me. And it's ultimately leads me to this question. What do we take away from where we are up until this point, right? So the first thing is this, we rarely, if ever, consume mass mediated messages in a vacuum, right? How do we receive a lot of mass mediated messages? I mean, I know that uh, you folks, not unlike us, go through regular executive elections. And of late, I think that you've experienced some misinformation that has perhaps existed <laughs> within society. And so sometimes you receive mediated messages from your crazy uncle on Facebook, I would imagine. I know I do, or at least I did before I unfollowed him. Um, so we, we rarely ever just receive a purely unadulterated mass mediated message that's devoid of all context. It's always, it always comes with the context. It's always surrounded by a whole bunch of other things. In the modern world, there are often many, many voices that we can observe while we're consuming a mass mediated message, right? Um, and whether it's on uh, Twitter, right? If, if you're on Twitter and somebody posts a video link of something that happens, well, you can watch that video link, but you cannot forget about the little message that they have sort of to caption it on top or Instagram. Instagram's another, another big one. Um, although I tend to try to keep myself away from anything political on Instagram, because otherwise I'll go nuts. Um, often photographs are paired with somebody's thoughts or ideas about a certain thing, right? So these things are not coming to us purely unadulterated. They're always couched in some sort of message. So third, computer-mediated communication might play an important role in the ways we respond to the mass media. That's where my thinking leads me and leads me to this general overarching research question. Um, and that is this, do these voices, do these, these messages that accompany mass mediated messages, often interpersonal messages, do these voices matter in terms of the message we cho choose to consume? In other words, our, our media selection? Uh, do they matter in terms of the experiences we have with the media we choose? Do, do they change the way that we enjoy mediated content? And how do these voices change the way these messages, these mass mediated messages have influence on us? So I'm going to I'm going to pause briefly and I know that I'm I'm saving some a bunch of time for questions at the end um but this is actually not a bad spot if if there are any questions there don't have to be uh but if you do have questions now could be a good time is it, is what I'm saying cl clear enough are you guys with me any questions I'll take that thumbs up because I am going to talk a little bit about the research that we conducted in this vein. Um, but to do that, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. And one thing that you, you really kind of need to know about me 
is that I really love, love boats. Just, I adore boats, everything about boats. I find them romantic. I find them charming. I love to go on very long rides for boats. In fact, my family and I, this is when uh, I was initially contacted to give this talk. They asked me to give a talk in July. And I had to say, I can't because I lived on a boat. We have a boat that we keep. Um, I, I live on not too far from Lake Michigan. And if you know anything about U.S. geography, you know that Lake Michigan basically runs the whole length of Michigan's lower peninsula. And we took a boat trip for basically all of July. We were gone. We lived on that boat. We slept on that boat. My 14-year-old son, my wife, and my two dogs. It was tight. And it was sometimes, I'm sure they were annoyed with me, but I loved it. I love everything about it. The reason I tell you that is so that you understand this next part. For those of you who are familiar with Michigan weather, um, and if you're not, you could be forgiven for that. But I did actually go onto the internet and looked up what the closest analog in the United States would be for Seoul. And it turns out that your weather is probably only a hair warmer than, than ours. That means in the winter, I can't be boating. The lake is frozen and um, I have to solve my boating itch in some other way. And the way that I solve that boating itch is by watching YouTube videos. There are actually a lot of channels, a lot of YouTube channels that usually publish about once a week. And basically they tell the story of themselves and their families sailing around the world, right? It's so much better to me than television. For the most part, this is it democratized content, right? So I started thinking as I'm watching one winter when I'm not boating, but watching sailing videos instead, um, boy, I wonder what the best ways would be for these people to really engage their audience and, and to make their audience more excited about the content that we're producing. And then I started to think, well, after every video that gets posted, there's an opportunity for interaction, right? There's an opportunity for interaction with one's audience. And in fact, uh, I pulled these comments today from the most recent version of this particular video. And these comments, due to the nature, the social affordances of computer-mediated communication, these comments are displayed in perpetuity for any viewer to look at, which is pretty cool. And so this is what I've got up on the screen is, is just a, a regular comment that I, was, I found I was able to grab. But there's a little bit more information than just the lexical information of that content. Certainly the content says, I'm excited that some great new content might be coming. This is almost classic Delos, yada, yada, yada. Right? But there's a few more little interesting tidbits that we're able to see. Um, this is related to a, a vignette that takes place in the video. Brian goes out drinking, forgets to close the hatches. Kaza says it's okay. These things happen. Now, something very interesting happens here. And I hope you can see, can you see my little cursor? Do you guys know what this is? This little icon with the heart, right? It means the content creator saw you. They saw your content and they loved it, right? So I started thinking to myself, I wonder if there's anything else we can see. Sure enough, we've got a comment here. And not only has the content creator seen the comment, they have actually replied. And everybody who looks at that video can see the content creator has actually not only seen that content, maybe even liked it, but they even took the time to reply. We're, we're in a, a fascinating whole new world here, right? Well, why are we in a whole new world? Well, one, YouTube allows for a democratized creation of content. In other words, that means anybody can create content. I don't know, for, for those of you who are familiar with uh, mass-mediated research, uh, there is a time-honored concept that 
the media sort of served as gatekeepers, right? And they were the ones who decided what was going to be a many to or one to many message. Well, YouTube allows anybody to put anything they want into an online space. That doesn't mean anybody has to watch it or even that the audience has to be large, but it does democratize the creation of content in some unique ways. That's cool. Second, it provides a vehicle for content creators to engage directly with content consumers, right? And this is where the concept of breaking the fifth wall comes in. How many of you have heard of the, the concept of breaking the fourth wall? A couple people, that's cool. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, the idea of breaking the fourth wall really comes from the idea that when a performer is on stage, there is a, a wall. There's there are three dimensions that they live in, you know, up, down, and back and forth. And at the very front of that stage, there's a wall that as a performer, you don't break. In other words, you don't acknowledge your audience. You don't address your audience. You pretend that you're in this world and no matter what that audience does, you don't interact with them. So that fourth wall in mediated content occasionally will get broken. If any of you are familiar with, and I'm going to date myself here, the movie, this is, uh, again, this is American culture and there may be better examples of this. Uh, that I just don't know about that many of you are from, more familiar with, but the, the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And uh, it's an older comedy starring John Cusack. And in that film, he very famously flaunts the breaking of the fourth wall. And we're in, uh, he'll be in the middle of a scene and he'll turn directly to the camera and he'll directly address the camera. And uh, we refer to that as breaking the fourth wall. Well, now we've got this situation in YouTube. Not only were, will YouTube content creators be able to address their audience, in fact, they'll sit there and engage with their audience. Their audience can engage with them, right? So this is the idea I'm trying to get at with the idea of breaking the fifth wall. We've now got this opportunity to directly have one-to-one -one interactions with content creators, which are stored in perpetuity for all the rest of the audience to read and consume. So we go back just briefly, and I can see the interaction that Brian from Sailing SV Delos is having with this other Brian Dale, right? As a viewer, does that affect my liking of the content? Does that affect the way I perceive that content? Does it affect the way I enjoy that content? And that's ultimately the fundamental research question in this study that we sought to pursue. I'm going to move fairly quickly through the study itself because, to be honest with you, it's a very basic study. We sought to determine whether we could find some experimental evidence for this effect. And essentially, does breaking the fifth wall have any effect? Does being able to observe communication between content creators and commenters have any effect on the way that I perceive mediated content? So the first study was experimental evidence, and we just ran a a fairly simple experience, experiment wherein all participants watched a movie trailer of the Disney movie Moana produced by the YouTube creator Screen Junkies. And you may or may not be familiar with that YouTube channel, but they create parody movie trailers. They're pretty funny if, uh, if you like that sort of thing. They are not objectionable and they would not make my IRB flip out. So that's who we chose. And so everybody watched this parody video and then participants viewed one of 12 different content sections that we created. Uh, really, this was a two by three by two experimental between subjects, experimental design, right? Where the main commenter was some unknown user, ostensibly a person just like you, or it was the actual professional account for Disney. And then when a secondary commenter was an unknown user, 
was the content creator themselves or there was no commenter and then we also manipulated uh, the comment valence I'll give you a few examples so you can see what I mean so everybody watches the same video content and then they see one of these uh, sets of comments so the first comment was always this person always had four likes always wanted them to do frozen this person was entirely the same the only reason that they, they were there they were held constant is so that it didn't look like there was just one comment right but they were exactly the same in every condition where we did our experimental manipulation uh was right here now the experimental manipulation everybody every time this comment got 182 likes uh, and you can see our main commenter here and our main commenter Ciara Chung uh, have been following screen junkies for years but this video is the best right so we've got an example of um a sort of unknown like there's no reason any of our Michigan State students probably knew this person well and we dreamed her up right there was no person that we could find with this identity another condition um was again we've got our our distractor comment above have been following screen junkies for years but CR Chung says this video got so many things wrong with a little mm, emoji face um and in response to that comment we've got now the content creator themselves saying they agreed with them 100 percent right they're the secondary commenter in this case so we've got our primary our main commenter and our secondary commenter um this is the condition where we've got a negative comment valence right and only the main commenter manipulated comment valence we did not manipulate the comment valence on the secondary commenter because all of a sudden you're, you're starting to talk about a lot of conditions if we start to do that well exactly 24 and that was that's too many um so and then our third condition uh we've got just an example here have been following the screen junkie for years and this is the one with the known commenter we've got the gray check mark to indicate no this really is disney and um we've in this condition we've got an unknown secondary commenter right so what we were ultimately interested in was this sort of mechanism that commenter identity had an effect on identification with the content creator which then had an effect on how much people enjoyed the content their attitudes toward the content itself right so the first step here was to uh, assess this relationship identification how much does my identification with the content creator does that have an effect on how much I like the content I would not have been surprised to see that relationship and so I wasn't surprised when I saw this relationship emerge now I will tell you I didn't expect it necessarily to be quite so strong um that's you know approximately 25 percent of the variance variance in um response to content and our our liking of the video that is being accounted for by how much we identify with the people who made that video um that's not bad it also gives us some hope that we might be able to scrape together some explained variants here uh, to find something interesting. Now, there were a lot of things that we looked at, but I and I I want to be able to get to my second study, so I'm not going to go too in depth here. Um, but we can we can talk about some of those other findings and 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 so forth. Uh, then we did a conditional mediation analysis, though, to look at the second part and found that, in fact, the indirect effect of content valence on enjoyment through identification with the content creator was only significant when the main comment was an unknown user. In other words, when this person who was the main commenter was a person just like you did not work when it was Disney, right? So didn't matter what the secondary commenter or who the secondary commenter was or whether there was no secondary comment, but if it was Ciara Chung or a person just like 
people in our study, and the secondary commenter was the content creator, that's when we saw that identification with the content creator mediated this relationship as we'd expect. That was an exciting finding to me because it really sort of validates what I really would have expected to see what's going on, right? So this conditional process analysis, if any of you are familiar with uh, Andrew Hayes's work on this area, Hayes conditional process analysis, there's a lot of things you really have to be careful about with Hayes conditional process analysis, most notably the selective fishing for findings that can be done <laughs> with Hayes conditional process analysis. However, there are a few of these moments, the strength of the analysis to be able to really help you to pinpoint conditions where you should see a thing. And then when you do see that thing in those conditions, but not others, it gives you some pretty nice confidence that you might be on onto something cool. Okay. Now, study one demonstrates that it's possible to observe these fifth wall type effects in a closed controlled laboratory environment, but let's be honest, we did not do stimulus sampling here. This was a video about Moana, and I could make people like it more or less based on the comments that were shown to those people and who those commenters were. That's interesting, but it's not the end of the story. Also, we do learn that observing communication between a content creator and, and a quote peer user, and I use that term peer carefully uh, because we don't actually know what our observers, how they would characterize this unknown user. We did not go into uh, and do that research. Uh, but it can, something is having an effect on our experiences, the media content. So study two, study two seeks to explore, is there evidence of these effects in the unregulated wilds of the uncontrolled non-laboratory based internet. And I want to tell you up front, I am not a computational communication scholar. The point is that this is really a first attempt for me. And so what we did in this study is that we observed 32 videos um, from several popular YouTube channels, including Screen Junkies, Watch Mojo, Cinemasons, that were similarly created parody video kinds of content. And then we tracked those videos over the course of 34 days each. So from the first day it was posted, we would track, we'd take at 10 p.m. every day. And in fact, um, one of the, the graduate student, uh, Si Wan Ma, who um, built all of the programming to collect all of the data was over at my house one night at 10 p.m. And he's like, Brandon, I need to use your internet. And, and I said, why do you need to, he's, he's got his laptop out. He's like, because we're collecting data for our study and I need to collect at exactly 10 p.m. <laughs> because that was the time we collected every night. Um, and so he hopped online, he collected data. I was very grateful. I, you know, So each new day we gathered the number of new likes each of those videos received. Each new lexical comment content, in fact, we got every, we scraped every comment that was left on these videos, in some cases, thousands per video. Um, and we used uh, ling linguistic inquiry and word count to code for positive or negative affective valence uh, of each thing. And then we also noted whether these comments originated from a content creator or another peer user. So we've got this actually very large data set um, of all the comments. All Each new day, we were able to do some lag sequential uh, time series kinds of analyses. And I don't have a ton of time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the, like what I think was the most interesting. The first is a finding that I did not expect. Perhaps some of you can help me make some sense of this. I have some ideas, um, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. So first, the more comments a video received, the fewer li daily likes it received. More comments leads to fewer likes. There's a negative relationship there. Now, interestingly, the more a content creator though, interacts with the user or interacts with users generally, 
the more daily likes a video receives. As time goes on, the more engagement a content creator has with their audience that's visible to the audience, the more favorably a video is received by the community. And then finally, the total negative interactions positively inter influence daily likes, while the total positive interactions negatively influence daily likes. In other words, the more positive words that were shared in comments, and again, you've got to understand some of the pitfalls of using linguistic inquiry and word count. It's just counting words. It's just giving you a ratio of positive to negative words that are being used. There's not semantic meaning that's being associated by the software system. So I understand that we're sort of looking at this with something of a dull knife. Um, but with that said, these were the, the findings that emerged. Now, to me, really the most interesting one is that the more a content creator interacts with users, the more daily likes a video receives. That's consistent with what I would expect. Some of these other things, boy, you put yourself out into YouTube and start collecting all of the data that is available to you. That's a lot of data and you're going to find some stuff that you maybe can't figure out. So conclusion, what's next? I think other questions that I'm interested in, how, how do peer interactions affect the experience of mediated content? We've talked about the ways that content creators and peers interacting affect the judgments of media content, but we don't really know about the ways that peers who are interacting with one another, how that's affecting um, the experience or selection of mediated content. Um, another thing associated with this um, that we haven't picked up on at all is what are the ways that peer-to-peer -peer interactions or peer-to-content creator interactions affect not only uh, a user's experience of mediated content, but also affect the algorithm, affect what gets shown to people, which has a direct effect on what kinds of content are being consumed. Or, or being sent to you to begin with? How do the differences in the ways that computer-mediated messages are encoded, transmitted, and decoded, how do they affect media selection, experience, and influence, right? How does this message sending process, would this be different if this was all synchronous communication rather than asynchronous? Possibly. I think that's an interesting question. How do all of these things affect our current understandings of mass communication and interpersonal theories? Um, and honestly, there is just absolutely a wide open slate. That's the exciting thing to me about this area. There is a wide open slate. You could do this research and it'd basically just be me and you doing this research. And that's a huge invitation. It's a huge opportunity. It doesn't make it the easiest research to publish. I'll tell you that much. But it is very, very engaging, and it's so much fun to do. With that said, I'll turn this loose, and we can talk for a little while.